Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining uh, FI Ghana event this evening, or uh, well, this evening from Ghana certainly is, wherever you are, um, you're welcome. Uh, we're glad to be partnering tonight with uh, Africa Comic Aid. So we always allow 10 minutes to uh, let everyone get into place, allow for any uh, challenges with uh, the internet, um, which invariably does happen. It's already happened twice a day, so <laughs> there you go. Um, so this is tonight's event. Um, it's quite out of the uh, out of left field for something we'd probably ordinarily do uh, with FI, but there's no reason why we shouldn't because um, when we're talking about digital startups, that includes creatives as well. So they absolutely should be included. And I'm glad we've got a fantastic uh, panel uh, arranged tonight together with uh, Africa Comic Aid. So a quick agenda, welcome. I've kind of done that, but I'm Simon Turner. I'm the uh, managing director for uh, Founder Institute Ghana. Um, then I'm going to do a little bit of an intro of uh, FI Ghana and who we are, why we're here. And we've got a deadline on Sunday. So this is the very, very last event we have um, before we start our next uh, cohort. Um, and then Oscar from Africa Comicade is going to take over. Uh, you're going to meet the panel, you're going to have a fantastic discussion, and you're not going to listen to any admin or anything like that from me. Um, and then we'll uh, finish off just by introducing next week's um, event, the final one. Um, and that will be it. We should be done within sort of, we allow for 90 minutes for these sessions. So uh, let, let's say eight o'clock uh, GMT. So welcome everyone. This is the event you come here for, but this is a little bit that I have to sneak in before we kick off into that. Um, a little bit about Founder Institute. So Founder Institute is the world's largest startup um, accelerator for pre-seed uh, startups. And that's not just tech, even though we are generally uh, tech focused or tech enabled. Um, we're in 95 countries. That's over 200, sorry, 95 countries. That's over 200 uh, cities or chapters. Um, we've created 6,000 companies in the last uh, decade. Now, working on the basis that only about a quarter of the grad, or only about a quarter of those who start Founder Institute graduate because it is so intense. Times six by four, and you can work out generally how many have started um, across the world there's about 20 25,000 uh, mentors in our mentor pool and one of the benefits of doing the program virtually from Ghana we used to be in person entirely so it always used to be in Accra uh, or in the capital cities and then everyone else used to lose out it also used to mean that we were only used to get the mentors that were available that day in that city whereas now we can get anyone in the world uh, within the mentor pool um, and that's not just for sessions like these, but perhaps more importantly, because that's what we're all about, um, it's for the 16 week cohort as well. You can see some numbers there. So they've gone up quite a lot. Uh, so uh, uh, we've raised about $1.75 billion for our uh, companies over the last decade, and they've got an estimated uh, portfolio value of 35 billion. So that's the big global picture. Uh, and locally, we've been here since 2019. We were one of the OGs when it comes to the uh, African landscape for FI. Um, I launched it in Accra in 2019, uh, and we've been going ever since. So we've got about to come up with our fourth one. Uh, I see one of my fellow directors, Fifi Bedu, is uh, here as well. Um, I'd say give a wave, Fifi, but it's kind of lost a little bit <laughs> on Zoom, isn't it? That just means you want to say something if you put your hand up. And Rashid's here as well. And so just some final dates, and then we'll get going. So the cohort is 16 weeks. Uh, that's part time. So we expect about 20 hours a week. And when I say 20 hours a week, we expect 20 hours a week. There's no hiding. There's no fluff. You can't hide. You can't like get someone else to do it, it'll be obvious because you're working hands on in your business. We don't teach theory. Uh, it's very hands on. And uh, the reason we use mentors is because they get to tell you from their perspective what they've learned. Um, for us, that's the best way to do it. Um, I have a second time founder myself, I wish something like this were around at the time rather than just 
feeling like I was asking stupid questions all the time or not knowing which questions to ask or whom to ask or that there were questions to ask. So that's why we use mentors and we try to use mentors from different sides of the globe. So we we'll use people. So for a particular session, for example, let's say we're doing customer development. We'll have someone from here, maybe in Ghana, from Nigeria, we use maybe a diaspora that understands the landscape of what it's like to do business in Africa, but doesn't necessarily have to be here. And then we can get someone totally from left field that has never even been to Africa and hasn't got a clue. But let's say they are the marketing director of one of the world's biggest airlines. When it comes to a marketing topic, they're probably useful to have on board because they've got something worth listening to. So we try and, I, certainly from a Ghana perspective, we try and open it up as much as possible uh, and have as many different ideas on the table uh, for their founders to then go and create their own businesses, uh, knowing that they've learned as much as possible as they can possibly do in 16 weeks. So anyway, the deadline to apply for Friday for the 422 cohort, which is virtual, so it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can join us, um, is this Sunday, Sunday the 21st of August. So all you need to do is go to fi.co slash Ghana, and you can find out plenty more information there. You can contact us, you can start the application. Um, most questions uh, can be answered there, but otherwise you can uh, reach us. Uh, the cohort will start on the 30th of August. And again, that will be virtual. So it doesn't matter where you are, you can join. We had so we had two cohorts ago. It was people on five continents. So even people back home from my home in Australia, um, people were joining there. But five continents, 16 countries were represented, making us one of the most uh, cosmopolitan cohorts. Uh, that's for sure. Right, okay, I'll shut up. Too much from me already. So, Oscar, Oscar from Africa Comicade, good evening. This is where you unmute, you turn your screen on, and I hand over to you. <laughs> good evening. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> it's great to have you. And this is, we've been working harder at um, collaborating with experts in their field um, through the session of recruitment. Uh, and this is our penultimate one. Uh, and it's actually the last one where we get to uh, collaborate. So I, Oscar, please make this a great one. Um, <laughs> I'm going to hand over to you to introduce yourself and then you can go through the panel and off you go. It's all yours. Yeah, super. Really excited. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> okay, then. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, to everyone listening, it's a pleasure to get to speak to you today, this evening whether you're from Ghana, anywhere from within Africa or outside Africa, it's a pleasure to have you join us in this panel session. My name is Oscar Michael, and I'm the founder of Africa Communicate. And what Africa Communicate is, is a platform for African digital creatives, creatives in the immersive and interactive media industry that has to do with games, animation, comics, and XR. And we created this platform to connect these creatives to opportunities because very little is being mentioned or said in the tech industry about the creative industry. Very little is done, very little is understood. So we created this platform to create that awareness as well as highlight the creatives working in that sector and connect them to opportunities across the globe. And in this panel, we are going to be speaking with industry leads from various sectors of this industry. And um, that's impressive enough. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call them in one after the other, and then they get to introduce themselves. So looking at the, the slide, we'll start with Jimmy. Yes, Jimmy, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, thanks. Thanks for thanks for having me on this. Uh, I love you know, um, I love the work you know Vanda Institute is doing, Africa Communicate is doing. You know, I'm glad to glad to be here. Um, this is the part where I introduce myself. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So hold on, hold on before you introduce yourself. Let me just do that. Okay. 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 
and the next is Aram. Aram, are you there? <laughs> Yes, I'm here, Oscar, and uh, good to you. Um, yes, uh, so thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Aram, Aram Tawia. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Letty Arts, which is a video game development company in Ghana and in Kenya. Um, yeah, so I think during the, uh, down the line, we can exactly. say more. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. And then we have tonight our next panelist. Yes, tonight, are you there? Oh, yes, here I am. Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah. Nice to be on here. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Junaid Tintuni Yakubu. I am uh, the founder of uh, Mariak Studios. I'm seeing now that it's Tintuni Studios. Mariak Studios, um, based in Tamale. And uh, we have been producing short films uh, throughout our practice so far and we're now looking to scale up to doing bigger projects yes super super <laughs> thank you very much just wanted to do a check quickly to see that all our panelists are on board and guys um from wherever you're listening what you're looking at right now are creative industry leads from the metaverse industry from the games industry and also from the movie industry film production and so much more and I'm really excited to be speaking with this late because we're going to be learning so much about their space as well as sharing knowledge to understand how we can grow the space much more better. So let's get right into it. Super. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to start with Jimmy. Um, Jimmy was like the first person I called uh, onto the scene. And um, Jimmy would love to get a good explanation, a much more um, intense introduction of yourself and what you do as well as your industry okay um thank you once again um my name is jimmy daudu i'm the founder and ceo of voltail where we're building a human-centric uh metaverse which i'll get to in a minute um about me um nigerian born um became british last last year and Ran away to Dubai after I became British uh, for a number of reasons. Um, married two kids, um, academic background, got a first degree in computer science, a master's in advanced computing, and finishing up an MBA at the University of Warwick. Uh, professionally, um, worked with FTSE 100 companies and Fortune 500 companies, um, Expedia, Barclays, Cold Cognizant, you know led transformation and change programs of, you know, two to, two to $10 million um, in the UK and um, set up Vault Hill early last year, um, got a team together, bootstrapped the first, and then um, did a, a token sale where we raised about $2.1 million late last year, early this year. Um, got a team of about 32, um, a number in Nigeria, a number in the UK, and um, a number across the world as well. Um, and what do we do? We're a metaverse company, right? And we have four product lines at Vault Hill. We have the, the metaverse itself. We have the NFT marketplace. We have avatars and we have XR consulting. And within, within the, the metaverse product line, we're building that from a human-centric perspective. And what I mean by that is We've taken, you know, seven out of 16 human instincts, um, curiosity, idealism, play, vitality, uh, romance, uh, creativity, and, and made a, an island or created a couple of islands across three and a half years. So that's the plan of what we're building. Um, 10,000 pieces of virtual land as an NFT. If I take vitality as a use case, we're looking to work with health and fitness providers, physio physiotherapies mental health positions to bring their services into the metaverse through immersive technology. So when I say immersive, we're talking more VR, AR rather than just web. Um, and th that is what we're doing. Again, we're looking at it from a content creator economy, whereby we have the NFT marketplace that we could use to monetize content creation and also a token that powers the economy of, of the metaverse and virtual world. And then we'll look at avatars early next year and look at um, you know, monetization of, of avatars. We've partnered with Ready Player Me right now to have characters within the world, but it's something we're looking to diversify and invest in further funds in early next year. 
And then lastly, XR Consulting, where we talk to brands, customers, consumers on all things metaverse. You know, what does it mean for your brand? Does it add value? Is it a good use case? You know, because everyone's hearing about the buzz and they're like, oh, they want to jump in. It's like, no, it's not for everyone. You know, the use cases where it would be like upfront to say, guys, your business model doesn't fit into the metaverse because of X number of reasons. So there isn't a reason for you to, you know, jump in. But again, for us, it's making sure we're tackling this from an educational perspective rather than the sales perspective. And that is me in a nutshell, guys. Nice. <laughs> I really love that introduction. Very, very, um, lots of information within there. And I'm sure people's minds are blown right now. Like last year, there was this metaverse buzz. Everybody wanted to understand what is the metaverse. People were trying to organize events. People were jumping in on NFTs. And so, yeah, it's, it's good to have you here to really answer those questions. I'm sure lots of people have. And um, yeah, so we'll be going on to introduce the next panelist. And what I really love about this session is we kind of have, um, how do I put it? There is like a stream in the creative industry. <laughs> so one of the first um, sectors to really develop, we would say in this panel is the movie industry. And then there was the games industry. <laughs> and now everyone is looking at something much more immersive and interactive, which is where you come in. This is really cool. So let me take uh, a swing back, jump over games <laughs> and go to one of the first industries in the entertainment and media side. So, that's the movie, the filmmaking industry. Junaid, are you there? Uh, yes, I am here. Uh, thank you very <laughs> much. Yes. Uh, yeah. Before I start, I would just like to say uh, a few years ago, I think I had met Aram at uh, Dartmouth <laughs> College. Uh, you were at Dartmouth for the Yali Fellowship. Yes. Very nice to reconnect with you on here. Yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, really thankful to be like uh, amongst my co-panelists. I'm really like uh, learning a lot. Like uh, I've learned a lot so far. Looking forward to hear more about your streets and uh, seeing how we can possibly collaborate in the future. Um, but my name is uh, Junaid Tony Yakubu. I am the founder of Mariak Studios, and uh, I have primarily been making short films. Um, my journey started in university, you know, like, uh, like a lot of Ghanaian kids. Uh, my parents expected me to pursue medicine, you know, but then in university, I had the opportunity. It was a liberal arts institution, so I had the opportunity to explore different fields. And I had always been interested in storytelling, you know, like I grew up watching movies on these VHS tapes or on TV whenever they would show them. And when I was in high school, I would mostly be reading novels and books. So I had always had an interest in storytelling. And I do remember being a kid. Um, and then, uh, like, I remember this was in the late 90s to early 2000s when I remember we had sort of a boom of the film industry, you know, Gollywood and Nollywood. I remember uh, after school, my mom would send me out to these uh, video rental stores, would rent a DVD or a VCD. Now, it was actually VCD, not DVD that we had back then. And then watch these movies, these Nigerian movies. That was the peak of popularity of... Uh, um, Genevieve, Ramzi Noah, Diaki and Popo, you know, and all of that, you know. And I remember collectively our imaginations were captured by these African movies, Ghanaian and Nigerian, you know. You know, like we had Suzy Williams, we had like Jackie Appiah and all these people, very exciting stuff. But, and I remember a lot of my friends and I used to watch these movies. But then over the years, like not so long after, 2008, 2009, my, like me and a lot of my peer group had, for the most part, checked out of actively engaging with our local film industries. You know, like Hollywood had taken over, you know? So a lot of these things were in my mind while I was in university. So when the opportunity to start exploring filmmaking emerged, I realized that I would like to prioritize the storytelling because I feel like the reason why we checked out all our local film industries is because the stories just weren't re reflecting our realities, you know, like we just weren't, uh, um, we just couldn't see ourselves in these stories anymore. Or 
our films just kept recycling the same themes over and over again. Not that there's anything wrong with exploring the same themes over and over again, but to some extent, I do think we need to be added to the conversation, you know? So with all of these things in mind, early on, I decided, this was back in 2014 when I decided these things. Uh, I was at Dartmouth College at the time, two years in, and I felt like it would be necessary to come back to Ghana and understand what it would be like to produce films in Ghana, you know? So I came back, uh, I had bought some basic filmmaking equipment, a camera, a microphone. Didn't really know much about what to expect or didn't really have much skill, you know, just the hope. I had taken a few film classes back then. So I had a bit of the foundation, right? So I came back and initially it was lonely, you know, because I came back, a lot of my friends didn't really understand what I was doing. Um, I was trying to create so much, but I didn't really have the team around me to support, you know? So early on, my first films were mostly just me acting in front of the camera and then shooting behind camera and then editing, you know, like I had to do all aspects of the production pipeline in order to be able to produce, you know? And then eventually my family started to become my primary casting crew. And then once I started to put work out there, my friends saw, what, saw that perhaps I was serious and they started to support in terms of introducing me to other people they know who were interested in filmmaking, you know? So I came back to Dartmouth, finished up my degree. Then I worked in New York City for uh, about a year on various film productions, you know, just to get uh, the, uh, the experience of what it's like on different film crews of different sizes. So I worked on really big crews with hundreds of people. I worked on very small crews with like two people, you know. So I got to see the different skills at which production can be done, you know. And then in 2019, I came back to Ghana to practice. And then when I came back, uh, thankfully, I have been able to meet a lot of really creative, brilliant, like-minded people in Tamale here who have become part of my core team that I have been able to create with. And I think right now, having created uh, so far being here, you know, initially I would say I was prospecting because I didn't really yeah. think about myself as a business, but as more like as an artist, you know, like I wanted to make films. I didn't really know what was up with that. And then I have learned how to make films by making these short films. So I view short films as a very good educational tool. So now that I'm here and then we have connected with the team, I'm also realizing that now it's time to scale things up. And one of the things that I'm trying to do in this next phase is not only produce films that I have written and directed, because that's what I've done in the past, but I do yeah. see myself now as a business, not only helping to express my ideas, but helping other people to express themselves, which I have done like uh, for the most part in my in the other side of what my company does which is uh like uh video creation services for various entities organizations and whatnot so we do commercials we do music videos we do fashion films you know so right. that experience you know like helping people express what it is they want to express, you know um it's also like opening up my mind to being like okay you know i want to be a film director but the industry here is not very sustainable. You know, like the biggest films from Ghana that do see global distribution or have a production value at what we could call the global standard. And when I say global standard, I don't necessarily mean like technically, like, oh, the lighting or whatever. That is good. I think we are capable of that. But I mean story, the depth of the story, you know. And I yes. do think, uh, wait, am I talking too long? So sorry about that. Um, but let no, me just worry, wrap it up here. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like I do think part of the work here is for me to be able to have a sustainable career here, I do need to invest in empowering the people around me in terms of sharing the knowledge that I have, whether it be by having workshops, you know, and just yeah. opening up the process such that people around me who are interested in learning and curious can see filmmaking as a viable career path, you know? We just had a screening uh, a few weeks ago, about a month ago, actually, exactly a month ago, uh, in Tamale at the Savannah Center for Contemporary Arts. Uh, a huge thank you to the people of the Savannah Center for Contemporary Arts, because this is a huge opportunity that I would not have had if not for the initiative of Ibrahim Mama, who built these institutions, you know? Ideally, yeah. like 
the cultural center in Tamale should have been handling, like given us filmmakers the opportunities to show our work, but we'll get there. Um, but at this screening, for the first time, I got to share my work with an in-person audience of people from Tamale. And then I was not only blown away by the number of people that showed up, because for the longest time, they have questions as to whether or not people will be interested in the kind of movies that I make, you know. Um, but they know not only showed up, but I was impressed with the engagement. You know, afterwards, a lot of people approached wanting to participate in the process or work on projects, you know. I had a lot of people who were interested in writing approach, asking how they could learn how to write scripts and all of that. So to some extent, the future of the studio heavily rests upon empowering the people within the ecosystem or within the space of Tamale to start to view filmmaking as a viable career path so that we can create collectively. And it's very exciting. Like the ideas coming from the team right now are very, very brilliant. And for the most part, our projects have been self-funded and, and that's because we're prospecting, right? But now I do think we have enough experience and data okay. to yeah. receive funding and take things to the next level. Yes, Super. thank you. Really cool, really cool. Um, I, I think I, you picked some things from what you said and we'll come back to, to that. You've said some really interesting stuff. Um, let, let's go to Aram. Aram, you've been in the, like, I consider you as one of the youngest, not one of, like one, <laughs> how do I put it? When it comes to games in Africa, you have been at the forefront, leading all kinds of initiatives from education, to actually start telling the African stories to the use of games. So yeah, please. Um, there are some people that might not know you, though I doubt that except they've not looked into the games industry. So please introduce yourself and tell us what you do with Let's <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Yes, um, so um, I think I'm really blessed to be um, going last um listening to Jimmy and uh uh Yakubu. And so I'm Aram and from what um we've heard, you could feel that everything comes from passion and wanting to make a difference to start a whole new industry, um, and not just a company. So um, we at Letty as we say we are starting a whole new industry, but not just a company, right? So um, so, so I grew up in uh, Kumasi. Uh, I was born on Kenyan USD campus. Uh, my whole life was on Kenyan uh, USD. So from hospital, Kenyan hospital, Kenyan nursery, Kenyan primary. Like I grew up um, uh, on that campus. So right from childhood, I I've been very passionate about video games and comics. Like. If you ask any of my mates now, Aram, they'll ask you, is he making games right from nursery school? So what I'm doing now would not be any surprise to most of my childhood friends who knew me. Um, but fast forward to um, around uh, class three, I was very passionate about science like comics, um, anything robotics and all that, right? And I also was obsessed with cartoons and you know, He-Man and Batman, Green Lantern. So I wanted to draw my own stories. And my dad was an art professor then. So he was my first illustrator. I wrote my story, then he illustrates and taught me how to draw and all that. Then uh, fast forward to um, JSS, I actually uh, met a friend who could draw better than I did. And we started a comic company together. I was writing my stories and he was drawing them. And as a child growing up in Ghana, then there were so many American videos or Western videos that, that have brainwashed us. So though I was fantasizing my own story, they, they were always in the West, in the West. You know, I've never, uh, my first story, uh, one of my best stories, sort of Saigos, was a fantasy story from Rome, a fantasy world in Rome, right here. And we made that comic in JSS. That was key and UST JSS. And in, when we made that comic, I wanted to make video games for that comic because the Green Lantern comics I had, had 
advertising of games like play green lantern on super nintendo and all that so that sparked my interest to to actually learn to code so i started learning um i'm q basic right from jss so i taught myself how to make video games then i built the game sort of cygos for my first comic and i had the diskettes all displayed in the comic and all that sold it across um, campus on the computers then and i met a group of friends um like friends um, who actually um together we were three as a group so we wanted to be bill gates steve jobs and more like we dreamt so big that hey we are going to conquer the world uh, as youngsters we were doing something new something unique so we formed a company in jss3 and we were minors but we managed to get someone in computer science to actually front to form a company called Topsoft. So fast forward to university, I actually um, saw the chance in university. Like I was a very geeky kid. Like all I thought of was games, computers, characters, superheroes, and all that, right? So, um, yeah, so I thought it wise to redo the game I did in QBasic as my final year thesis on campus. I'm computer science. I read computer science. So sort of Cygos, I redid it in 3D on campus as my final year thesis. And I remember those days, uh, that was 206. Uh, my professors were like, hey, ah, you are coming to make a game. You will want something. You say video game. And um, and um one of them, uh, Professor Aqua, is like, no, Aram, what did you say you wanted to make a video game? Okay, I'll supervise you. So, and that has become a whole new industry. So I always credit that nod to what, like what I'm doing now to the nod that that professor, like my supervisor gave me, hey, make, make a game and I'll supervise you. And so sort of cycles in the history books of games has become kind of, one of the first games to be made from sub-Saharan Africa in, in the history books of games. So in 2007, wow. I met my yeah. co-founder Wesley from, from Kenya. And, uh, and yeah, and then fast forward now, we actually, uh, we met online fighting of who made a game on, in Africa first. And then yeah. a year later, we decided to collaborate instead of compete and we started letty arts in 2009 so and we've been video games based on african history and folklore and also using um games to actually impact africa yeah globally so yes yeah <laughs> we'll know more about what we do cool yeah definitely definitely we're going to um learn more and that's a really interesting story I think one thing everyone that has listened to every panel list speak is that you come to see that one thing that really drives the creative industry is passion. Um, that's something that has kept all these stakeholders to keep on moving despite all the challenges. But now we're entering a new era where passion is not sustainable enough. Now we have to think of our creative skills as a business. How do we turn these skills to a business? How do we monetize it? And those are the little things we're going to be moving into right now. But then I'll start out my, a question with um, Jimmy. And I'll, I'll go through. I have a couple of questions which we'll go through each other quickly. And um, we'll see what the responses are. Because we need to start thinking of this industry as a business, as something that can bring about socioeconomic development for Africa. So the first question, um, <laughs> which might seem not like a question by statement, but I find it very important. It's Jimmy, would you say Africa is ready for the metaverse? Would you say this is what we should really start looking at? Because there's a lot of thoughts from various stakeholders. Should we look at the metaverse right now? It was much more understandable to so many people during the pandemic due to everybody went remote. But now, a lot more um, people are struggling to get balance back into their life, reduce the virtual activity and the like. So would you say the metaverse is something that we as Africans are ready for? What's your take on that? 
So it it depends on who you talk to, right? They're different school of school of thoughts. But um, I, I was actually in Lagos, Nigeria. I left Lagos on on Monday um, back to Dubai. I was invited by the Nigerian British Chambers of Commerce and Industry to talk about NFTs and metaverse. And you know, the same analogy I was given on the panel is. When we talk about the metaverse, you know, it's a virtual shared social space, right? And where we are right now is where floppy disks were when they came out in the 80s. You know, fast forward floppy disks to CDs, to DVDs, to MP3s, to flash drives, to cloud computing where you have unlimited storage. Now imagine floppy disks where you had, you know, I think a max of two point something megabytes you know, in terms of maximum storage, like one app on your phone right now is like 600 MB. So imagine how we were leaving back then compared to now. So that is where we are right now in terms of the metaverse and the transition of immersive technology, right? The, the hardware is still a challenge, right? The cost is still, you know, the challenge. Access to the internet is still the challenge. I see this taking off again within the next two to three years, but we Africa specifically, and I was saying this to someone over the weekend, we are like this when it comes to innovation and takeoff. Like we, like we, move, we move like at the light of speed when we understand it and we're ready, right? If I look at GSMs and the internet specifically to Nigeria, you know, back in 20, 2000 and 2003, yes. When M um, GSM came out and MTN was like 60,000, Naira SIM card, and now it's like 200 with free airtime. We picked, you know, um, mobile phones up quickly. You know, again, there's, there's, there's statistics that say there's more mobile phones in Africa than clean water. You know, so when it comes to technology, Africa, no, they carry last, you know, but right now, when it comes to the metaverse, I think we're still a couple of years away, even in the West you know, in yeah. London, in US, you know, wherever you are, there's still that resistance around the, the technology and also the definition, because you see people that have WebGL and, you know, um, 3GS and it's like, oh, it's a metaverse, okay, fine. You see people that are building in Unity and Unreal, it's a metaverse, okay, it's immersive. So again, yeah. the, the concept <laughs> of the metaverse is still questionable. Then we mm -hmm. now have the challenge of the hardware we have the challenge of the compute power, what you can do within the game development life cycle. You know, Iram, you know, you know a, a whole lot of that, you know, shaders, textures, try, poly count, all of that complications of, you know, putting all of that in that, either in a Oculus Quest or MetaQuest, HTC Vive Flow or Pico device, you know, all of that is still where we are. So I say in another two to three years, yes. And a lot of the education, or sorry, a lot of the adoption is around education. So panels like this, where we start to talk about the challenges, the opportunities, the benefits. And I'm a big proponent around education. You know, I keep telling people, I'm not trying to sell anything. You come and buy when you know what you want to buy, you know, but come and understand first. This is the possibilities. You know, you could, you know, if you're, if you're bored in a marketing job in a traditional world, come within the Web3 metaverse space. This is how we do things differently. Discord, Telegram, come on, come, just come on, understand that there's a different world out there that, you know, what you do today, you know, and yeah. it's exciting, it's challenging. There are a lot of opportunities, but to answer your question, I think Africa is, you know, going to be one of those continents that take off once this lands. And I think the, the education, the sensitization of people being aware is important. And, you know, we're trying to attack that or target that from an educational perspective where we go to universities, we do some show and tell, we come on panels, we talk about what we're building and all of that good stuff and try and do, you know, where we have physical activations, we try and do demos and all of that for people to jump in and understand, you know, what we're building and all of that. So I'd say, you know, in another two to three years, fingers crossed. But again, all of this is dependent on the big boys like, you know, Meta and um, Apple bringing out some devices that, you know, transform how we do this, you know, Apple comes yeah. out with their AR, VR device this year, next year, there are rumors everywhere until they drop it, you know, that, that could change the face of how we interact, you know, virtually.
Yeah, I, re I really love um, what you said, especially with respect to um, adoption and innovation. Like Body of Africa is where the innovation with mobile money actually came out from, nowhere else in the world. And that's because once we pick up a technology and it's accessible to us, from there we can do so many amazing stuff. So yeah, thanks for that. I think you, for me, answered that question. And I'm sure if anyone has a question to respect to that, please make use of the comment section. Drop your questions there so that Jimmy can attend to them. So now, I'm moving to Aram right now. <laughs> Jimmy has, because Jimmy is building something right now that an average man will be like, what, what, what are you doing? <laughs> But at Aram, you're in the games industry, and when we look at Africa, for the last, for the past decade, there's been lots of game studios come up and also leave the scene. So what we've come to realize is there's a lot of struggle in terms of running a sustainable business in the games industry. But during the pandemic, once more, more Africans started playing games. Um, news will release the data that the games market in Africa is worth about $590 million. Though a bulk of this revenue does not go to local African game startups, but foreign startups. And globally, the games industry is bigger than the movie and music industry. So, Arab, we have to ask you now because you've seen it all. <laughs> you've been there at the very beginning. And now with a new buzz, with a new wave of studios coming up, you are still here trying to innovate and support all those stakeholders. What do you see in the games industry of today? Are we ready? Should we expect more positive outlook from the market? Um, yes, and um, the reason why I'm still here is that, yes, it's bigger than the movie and the music industry combined. And, and that was it for me 13 years ago and right from childhood and it is still now. And yes, Africa still does not even contribute uh, um, 2% to the global revenues that we see. And we are over a billion people on the continent. So there's so much potential with, um, with gaming and that is how come we are still relevant. And you began by saying that um, passion alone does not um, uh, make you successful, but uh, I should tell you that you need a lot of a, a hell lot of passion in the gaming industry to actually be running over 13 years as Letty Arts has been doing and also innovating around the space. And one of the things that I tell people is that uh, for me, I told myself that I have uh, I actually sacrificed myself for the video game industry to make sure that everything that is earned by me is from video games. And as I speak, I have a wife, I have four kids. I have, I have like, I'm taking care of a full family on video games, every person that has been earned since I finished every world, every country I've, tra I've traveled several countries because of games. I've actually been like, all that we are doing here is because of video games. I've done nothing. I've done, I've done, I've not done banking applications. I've, I've not done anything, but I'm a computer science person, right? So to be able to sustain that great and create an industry, we need a lot of more examples as us. And if you look at even gaming in, in the Nigerian industry, it actually shut down. A lot of studios came from Nigeria in the 2012. And only Malio games is still surviving now. Sure. And, and we call yeah. each other, hey, like we are like, hey, bros, we are, you know, how do you do it, bro? You know, how do you, you know, and we need that sort of grit to keep um to keep going just because of the opportunities. And as we said, capacity building, there are four major challenges that are still existing now and being solved. Right, the first is human resource, which is capacity building. So we keep doing internships. Like Letty Arts has trained over 400 interns. As I speak, I'm hosting 15 interns now, actually doing their strength heightening things. We have artists, people. Yeah, we have artists. We have programmers. We have lawyers. I have a lawyer intern who is interning in the law aspect of of video games. Um, I have story narrative, narrative consultants who are English major who can write stories and are just 
learning how to build narratives for very nice games mechanics, right? Um, I have interns exploring NFTs, exploring Web3 um, um, integrations for the future, you know, and also games for IOTs, um, games for, you know, games cut across every section, even films, choose your own adventure films, choose your own ending films, like where stories end, games begin. And Africa has so many stories. Every movie is here to have its game. Every movie is here to have its comic, its merchandise. It's like, the, like the industry is so huge. And to end it with the metaverse, like even in the physical world, we are not done. We've explored a percent and now there's a virtual world, which means that you are going to double your like, Endless. I can own a land here and sell it hundred times in the metaverse. I can. It's 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 endless. So I tell people, look, the opportunity is huge. It's huge. It's huge. We only have to keep doing what we are doing. Keep creating. Keep training. Keep teaching people. Yeah. Keep exposing people to the possibilities. Keep on having talks. Keep on living the dream and getting youngsters yeah. to become game developers my kids are my game testers as i speak <laughs> they are testing four games for me Hamza run which is a game that uh, being supported by ubisoft and we are in a co-production market amazing game and they are playing in it and giving me feedback they are six seven year wow. old i have hey, well, hope, hope you're paying them hope you're paying them testing <laughs> they're charging me money they're like that what if i test this pay me pay me money, you know, and <laughs> it's, it's amazing to hear kids be like, I want to be a game developer. I, it's, it's amazing, right? So let's keep doing this. And um, I think Oscar, what you guys are doing, it's amazing. Um, and meeting my colleagues here, we are all creatives and anything can be made interactive and made and skilled. So the movies, the short movies you have, we can use games to scale it, to make it much more fun, create a branch out of it and generate revenue even before the movie comes out, right? Or even while the movie is playing, you can be making money through interactivity, like interactions, you know? And these are the possibilities that our industry brings to the group. So. Yeah, I'll okay. um, I, yeah, I'll be here for more follow up questions to see how the monetization yeah. uh, aspect of the business models as we go on. Cool, cool, nice. Yeah, I I I I don't know if you guys planned this, but it's so great to see the the network, the connection between what Jimmy said with respect to yes, there are some challenges right now, but Africa is that continent that wants to pick something they'll pull through. And then here you are also speaking about the interoperability in the industry, how games can fit into movies, music, and even the metaverse, which is what we are all looking up to now as a future of entertainment and interaction. That's really, really super. And yeah, that's why I'm in the industry as well, everyone. So much potential on tap. And we are going to continue having discussions like this to make every stakeholder aware. Now let's go to Janae. Um, you are in the movie industry and a lot of innovation is also happening there. Um, one would think the movie industry has matured and is ripe, but no, so many things are happening there. Especially with recently, the, um, if you look around now, distributors, traditional distributors are now um, subscription video on demand platforms. These are the people sponsoring the creation of movies. These are people distributing movies. So looking at it, you are making short films, which we all know is like the best and first way to really start creating stories that can connect with people. What are you looking at from the movie industry? Now you can see this innovation happening around you. What is happening in your space? What are you looking out for? What does the future hold for the movie industry? Uh, uh, actors or producers looking at collaborating? Is there something we don't know? Yeah, fill us in. <laughs> Is 
Is your name there? Oh, yes. Uh, when Aaron was talking, uh, he mentioned something, you know, like having his kids test the games that he's working on, on, you know. And that just really struck me as like very, very important within these spaces, uh, within our spaces here. Because I remember as a kid, you know, I mentioned that I've always been interested in stronger. So as a kid, we're about uh, around 12 years old. We had this desire or fantasy to write uh, a book together, me and my friends in the neighborhood, you know, we called ourselves pro progressive moves. Yeah. So it was a bunch of us kids, you know, like uh, we, some of us had a bit of a reading habit. So we wanted to write something with the books we had been reading, right? Um, and then we started all by ourselves, you know, like uh, we would write pieces, uh, meet, read them to each other, review them. Like the process was not very organized. We didn't really know what we we're doing. But the point I'm trying to make is that we had the desire and the passion, but we did not have the guidance. I mean, our parents, I mean, were not really all that equipped to guide us because, I mean, they themselves were no writers and we didn't know any writers around us. So I think having examples is a very, very good thing. You know, like in my practice, it has always been an educational approach. It would always be an educational approach, you know. Short films for me, uh, the fastest way for me to learn really how to make good films. I mean, almost every filmmaker's desire is to make their first feature film, right? So that's what launches the career. And yes, that is my desire. And uh, when I first started out, I would acknowledge a lot of my desire, like a lot of my ambitions were a bit shallow. And that's fine. I think a lot of things that eventually are deep start out shallow, you know? Um, yeah. Like, I, I wanted to be a director, you know, I didn't really know much what there, there was to it. But in the exploration and the pursuit, making these short films, one after the other, I have learned a lot. And I think some of my aspirations have gotten a bit more deep, you know. So thinking about how to grow the industry, I do think one, education, you know like the educational approach personally, but also looking to help share knowledge, you know? Like a lot of us uh, young entrepreneurs, young people trying to actualize in the world, sometimes get so caught up with wanting to connect with those above us, those older than us, those ahead of the journey, like, uh, like uh, than us. But so far in my experience, I've found that I have been massively inspired and like bursting with ideas when I have opened myself up to connecting with the young people around me, you know, and talking about innovation. Oh my God, what these young people are doing, what the youth is doing all across the board, you know, like, I mean, I'm meeting yeah. so many people here in Tamale and it's feel like, and also here's the thing, Northern Ghana has been somewhat cut off from some opportunities, accessibility and all mm -hmm. of that, you know, so to some extent, yeah. even when I was in the U.S. wanting to come back to Ghana, I imagined, okay, I'm just going to come to Tamale, visit my family to Accra. I will be based and work. Because the assumption is that, oh, I wouldn't meet like-minded people in Tamale to be able to work with. But, oh my God, that was such a wrong assumption. Like, I mean, <laughs> some of the smartest, most brilliant people I've met are from here, who I am continuing to meet, you know. And, you know, like these kids, you know, like learning, like, like these digital art, vi like visual effects without having a working computer, you know, having to borrow time on their friend's computer to like watch these YouTube tutorials and learn. This is so like impressive and inspiring as a person who's maybe a bit older in this system, you know, I'm kind of like, wow, I really do need to do all I can to be able to help them express themselves, you know? And by so doing, I get to learn a lot more. So now here's the thing, a thing that I've been thinking about a lot uh, recently, you know, because of new people I've met and new possibilities um, that have emerged from having uh, done new work and shared this new work, you know? It's kind of like a filmmaker wants to make their first feature film. You know, like if I had $100,000, okay, maybe I use it to make my first feature film. But I'm also thinking in terms of the sustainability of it, because it is true that a lot of the African films that have seen global recognition have usually been productions by entities 
piece outside of the continent. You know, like uh, like a Hollywood studio producing a movie, like for example, Beasts of No Nations, Hotel Rwanda, and to some extent, even the excuse me to say the perspectives shown in these films are about aspects of our history and our life that personally, you know, like they're a bit dark. We're not so proud of, and it's not that these narratives do not deserve to be told, but overwhelmingly, these are the ones that we see of ourselves, you know? And I do think we need to complicate what we see, the reflection. So going back to what I was saying, you know, $100,000. I'm thinking now it would be better to invest this $100,000 into making several short films. By using these short films as an educational tool for young filmmakers to learn how to make films. So, you know, for the most part, I've been producing films that I have written and directed. But now maybe like uh, thinking of myself as also a producer who's able to help yeah. young writers and young director, directors to express themselves, you know? So this yeah. would even create prompts for people in the industry. You know, like, for example, like one of the things I would like to do if when I do have the resources is like uh, have, let's say, a monthly or like every three months screenwriting competition, maybe such a prompt, or it's just open call for submissions, right? And then maybe, you know, like uh, the winning script and then produce yeah. that script, that short film, you know? I'll, like an opening up the process for the writers to be able to see yeah. what the process is. Who knows, maybe they would uh, like uh, start to think of screenwriting as a, a viable career path, you know? So these are possibilities I'm thinking. But the thing is like, if I invested this thousand dollars into making one feature film, yes, I've made it. It's a great film. It sees global recognition. But then I come back. What comes next? Are we really able to keep making films? You know. But if we do short films, we can gradually scale up, and then also learn a lot to be able to make good feature films that really tell our stories. That people can watch and be like, "Wow, this reflects my reality." Because honestly, a lot of the and excuse me to say this, you know, like a lot of the local yeah. films that I have watched have not really, I have not been able to connect with. Like, take for example, one example, like in a lot of the Gollywood films, you know, like uh, you have people randomly speaking in somewhat of an American accent. I am even speaking in that, you know, which is because of certain reasons. But like when I'm watching a Ghanaian film and I see people speaking in an accent that I know the average Ghanaian doesn't speak in, Unless, let's say, maybe it's for a specific reason, you know, to some extent, it takes me out of it, you know. But of course, yeah. these are just my perspectives. Yeah. Cool. I don't cool. know if I answered I like, the question. I like what you, yeah, I, I like what you said there, um, because that brings me to a question I'd reserve specifically for Jimmy, where you spoke about the funding, using the funding to actually um, use in promoting more production and creating that enabling environment for creators. Now, Jimmy, in one of your, your videos online, <laughs> you said funding is the, raising money is the, is the easiest thing. <laughs> I think, I think, yeah, I I think that one. video put me in trouble. The amount of, the amount, it, it was, a, it was <laughs> what I put the word, it was a figure of speech when I said it, but the amount of messages I got, I was like, oh my days, guys. Uh, but, but carry on, carry on, Oscar. Yeah. So you said raising money is easier, the team development and all is what is much more um, difficult. And yes, I appreciate that. But then when you say raising money is easy, a lot of creatives start saying, really? <laughs> they then show me the way. So please, um, funding is not really going a lot into the creative industry. Of course, there's more funding going in perhaps the metaverse space, NFTs, because they're more futuristic. But like in games and movies, there's a lot of communication, education that needs to happen. But you've obviously raised funding and you have a hack around things. Can you share with us, what would you tell founders who are starting up, who are looking for funding? What would you tell them to, what approach would you ask them to take? So again, I think you're right. Now that I've heard you played back, you know, if I, if I look at a lot of creatives that are looking for funding and it's not been the easiest, then my comment then sounds a bit, mm. But again, I say it with context in the sense of, you know, last year, I kid you not, I think we had over 75 meetings, you know, with various folks, you know, talking about what we're building, trying to raise money. And 
you know, would, would have would have like, you know, four hour conversation across a week with the same folks. And I think out of the day, you know, that four hour conversation led to like, you know, a thousand dollars in rates, for example, I'm just painting a scenario. And we had a team of like three or four people that, you know, just being on a meeting, you know, three of us being on a meeting is like, you know, a thousand dollars already, you know. So again, it's looking at the cost and balance of what we're trying to raise. And what, what I'll say is look at, again, it depends on what you're doing, right? We were building a product, we were setting up a company, you know, tech startup, way different from, you know, trying to get a project off the ground. Again, it depends on who yeah. you're talking to and, and um, all of that. I think what is important is always the, the instrument of the raise. You know, some folks do convertible loans, some folks do equity. Obviously, within the blockchain crypto side, there's, you know, token, um, um, a token way of spinning up a token and, you know, reaching out to community members to buy tokens on, on the promise of your project and obviously delivering on that. So I think I was coming from that conversation of when we were talking to, I think we spent the best part of August to November last year talking to people this was the most challenging part of my life ever since I was born. I kid you know, this like late last year, like I almost even lost my marriage at one point because my wife was giving me, you know, I mean, like 2 a.m. I'm on a call with Canada, you know, 5 a.m. I'm on a call with India or I can't remember, like it was intense and I wasn't pushing calls back and that was one thing I should have done, you know, look at my own schedule and push. Anyone that said, hey, they were ready to talk, I'm like, guys, let's jump on the call. You know, we're trying to grasp and get that money and, you know, take off as quickly as possible. But there, there are a lot of lessons learned. But I think going back to your question, it's around, when I said it's access, again, it depends on what you're building. I was talking about this from my own industry in terms of blockchain, cryptocurrency, you know, um, metaverse and all of that. When, you know, between eight August and November we're struggling, you know, loads of hours. And then we had a we had a pitch competition at an event called DeFi Live in London. And we were one of, you know, I think 40 startups picked up top five. I think we came second in the pitch. Um, and then we're on a panel where we're talking about NFTs and metaverse and um a launch pad. So in the crypto world, you know, if you have a token. If you want to raise funds, you do it through launch pads, you know, Binance, Polkadot, Starter, you know, a lot of popular cryptocurrency exchanges have their own launch pads. And, you know, we applied to Polka Starter. I think we had about five different meetings. That was the only, com you know, launch pad that we were going to. Like, I was like, guys, we need to hit this, put all our eggs in that basket. And I think on the last yeah. day, they came back with unfortunate email and saying, you know, they wouldn't be listed, um, taking us on. I was like, I wanted the ground to open up and swallow us, because swallow me, because you know when you put your mind into something and you're like, ah, I just have to click and it doesn't. That was how I felt. And you know, we, we looked our wounds, we looked for other alternatives, you know, I was bootstrapped in. Um, I sold a couple of assets to fund. I think we had about 10 people full time um on the team. And then we went to this event and um these guys approached us to say, hey, we like your pitch. Where are you guys, you know, what are you guys doing, blah, blah, blah. Ooh. And then those yeah. guys opened a door for us. And then we went from a minus one launch pad telling us, you know, hey, we're not listing you to plus seven in a space of like four weeks. I remember the day, you know, the, the first guys, Lithium Ventures, you know, put out a blog post on, you know, them taking off and raising, you know, um, on their launch pad. I think we did about $120,000 that weekend. I was like, hold on, what is this? Like, I've been, you know, trying to wrap my head around raising money. And this guy just, they put up, they didn't even sell our focus. They just said they're listing us next year. And, you know, we got, you know, um, sucked out in, in, in a tune of 120. Like, my team was like, Jimmy, I don't have time to process this. We, we're working night shift today. Because we're, we're sending contracts, KYC, and all of that. So that's why I went with it was easy because. All of that period of time, it just started coming. Like it was like God just opened the door and everything just flew in. And the next challenge was, okay, now we have some money. How do we scale up? You know, how do we look at the people we've hired that, you know, we might have outgrown? How do we look at start bringing people in? Then we had the, um, what I said, the lucky challenge of building in Unity versus Unreal. You know, having conversations with peers in the industry you know, I know someone that uh, a project that spent about $1.2 million 
building on Unity and Unreal and had to pivot on Unreal Engine. And that decision cost about hundred and um, $1.2 million. We did that. That decision cost us about $30,000, which again was expensive, but it was something we needed to do because we were trying to ensure that we're going with the right path strategically, right? And then all of the conversation was more around, okay, how do we start scaling the team? How do we start hiring? Where do we yeah. hire from? Yeah. You know, the diversity of resources, you know, low cost, high cost, medium. So I'll say back to your question yeah. in terms of funding, I think one, know what you're trying to offer investors because the question is always, what am I getting in return? You know, yeah. know who your target audience is. We did a lot of research, like, like you know, Nick, my, my co-founder, he's, he's one of the strat guys from, from Accenture, left Accenture to join us full time. So it, it's very important. That research piece is very, very important. Have a, have a spreadsheet of your target people, you know, come to events like this, network to understand, okay, if you're trying to reach someone in a company, look at the events they're going to be at. And then try and, you know, find your way to that event and, you know, find a way to get a contact here and there. But it, it's just like sales as well. It's the same thing as sales. You need to just be very dogged and perseverant. You know, having your mind, people are going to tell you no, so be mentally prepared. And then, you know, when you get that yes and yes and yes, you know, you, you get on a high. But again, it's not the money. I kid you not, know, like, there are times when... I'm like, oh, well, it's not money that is solving this problem. It's either, you know, there's a lack of talent, like Iram said, you know, we have to bring in interns and upskill them. And then the quality of the work is not the greatest. We miss deadlines. Yeah. It's the execution. It's always the execution, mm. you know. So I, I think those are the kind of, you know, advice I'll give folks that are trying to raise money or get into this full, into this space and, you know, sustain themselves. It's The execution is hard. I kid you not. It is very, very hard. But... Once yeah. you once you get into that rhythm, you know, Aram has been in this game for, you know, I'll say he's a, he's a veteran, you know, um, he's been in this game for a while. So, you know, we should we should actually be taking kids from here, not me. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Thanks so much for that. That was really, really insightful and helpful. Yeah. Um, we're really out of time right now, um, but this has really been wonderful. But before we round up, I really, really would love to hear from Aram. Um, Jimmy has spoken about funding. Junaid has spoken about collaboration, about going out there to work with youth and so much more. Um, Aram, as a founder who has really, really shown persistence and commitment to his passion, a lot of creatives out there right now are being stressed with growing their startup. What do you have to tell them? Um, so for me, I always um, push push that passion bit as well. Um, especially in the creative space, you don't have to lose passion first because I believe that once you are passionate about what you do, you can easily raise funding. And as um, Jimmy said, funding is always the easiest part once you have decided on what you want to do and how you want to do it. So I would rather invest more in teams, in my network, in my vision. Then once that is solid, you can now um, find the right funding partner to scale up that idea. And that's how come we, like, we have learned the hard way. We started um, at a point we had passion, we had money, but the vision wasn't clear we bent through that money. And when money finished, we now saw the vision clearly and started building from scratch. And now we are ready to raise money uh, funding again. But then we figured out how to make money as well with our skill sets, right? So once you have, if like you can't just have money and think without a vision, you will bend through that money no matter how much it is. So you have to make sure that you have your, like your vision, your team, and uh, your network really fixed before you get money as full to propel and scale. And I always say be richer in passion than money because money will come and go, but passion is what keeps you driving on, right? And also just do it and be a nice guy, always smile. And uh, yeah, God will, God will do the rest. Once you smile, you push and yeah, you, yeah, you keep keeping on. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, Oscar, you are on mute if you are speaking. Okay, I just want to okay. say like. Okay, okay go. Go right. no, oh, no, no, I just wanted to see like uh, I am like so so thankful I got to hear you both talk like share your perspectives on funding and all of that you know because I think uh, I am also entering that age where I think I am ready for funding and like for the longest time again like just trying to make sure that okay I understand what it is that we are trying to present you know um, so. I would really like to stay in touch and keep connected, you know, like uh, to ask more questions uh, regarding all of these things, you know? Yeah, but like one thing I was also thinking about was kind of like also like to some extent, like for example, like in a field like filmmaking, yeah, like funding is not the most important thing. And that is true in my experience because I have gone throughout all of my practice without having received funding from any entity. And I have been able to produce through the support of friends and family primarily. You know, and you know, like uh, right now, you, you know, you get to a stage where, like, to some extent, to express yourself. Yeah, because a lot of the Tamale filmmakers I've met, the young filmmakers talk about the frustration of pursuing filmmaking uh, in isolation or without having the knowledge or the tools or the like uh, the the collaborators to work with. You know, and more and more, to some extent the large problem is not necessarily about the money, but more about finding each other to work with. So I'll keep that in mind, you know, like investing in people or like connecting with more people. Thank you very much. Yes. I just wanted to try and bind that together because I was getting really nervous at one point that when exactly. I heard that Jimmy saying that, you know, getting funding is the easy part, knowing that I'm about to get a hundred emails tomorrow saying, but you say it's so difficult. It's no, difficult. what I say is that if you don't have a fully fledged idea or product, yep. you've got nothing to sell. And I yep. also say that getting funding will not get you out of bed in the morning when times are tough. Yeah, money might, He'll help you get out of bed, but that desire will not help you get out of bed. And you know, raising funding is a full-time job. Yeah. Even like when you're saying, when you've got a, uh, your product is there for the world to see and you've got awards, you've done well, you know, it's still not easy. But for a lot of the young guys, first time founders that are starting up, if they think that getting money is easy, <laughs> it's okay, so let's, People that are listening in, it's not. But as Jimmy and uh, Aram and uh, Tim Tony were saying, you know, and even what Tim Tony was, like, was saying from the other side, you really need to have that fully fleshed out product. It's not, it'll never be the best, but something solid, like past MVP to show for it. Show for it, and you know, getting money from friends and families and fools for the three Fs. Um, don't often like to say the third one, but sometimes we'll take money from wherever it is. Um, the, that that keeps us churning. That keeps us going to get to that point. But it gets to the tipping point that you, to, to get to the next level, then you're going to need funding from elsewhere. And that's when you start to have a discussion. And it can't just be any money from anywhere because you are getting into bed with someone. <laughs> and when you get into bed with someone, you better know who you're getting into bed with for a whole bunch of reasons. So that's the best way I can put it. Oscar, I was just killing time whilst you dropped off. <laughs> that is an important point I wanted to bring up because for every being in pre say given the FI's pre seed, it comes up all the time. Uh, and because we're the only non development or aid funded program doing this yeah. as well, we also get that problem that we're not just handing out money. Uh, we want to see something. <laughs> we expect yeah. our founders to still be going five years' time um not have nothing to show for it at the end of the year exactly uh -huh. and i think we can definitely also do something together the three of us with uh tsunami having your story writing and your scripting for film don't just wait for film you can let us do the comics for those stories because those stories still do the comics they can still become game mm -hmm. narratives and we can use those narratives in the metaverse we can buy land in jimmy's world and make a narrative of your story in that world and people can experience it and pay us for money and we make money. Wow. So yeah, wow. so let's keep wow. 
talking and Aram, see. Aram, Aram, wow. Like, you know, so <laughs> one of the things that we're trying to do more of is uh, actually do a lot more of pre-production, which is, uh, yeah. you know, like just, you know, like just prepping thoroughly, but mostly in the visual side, you know, storyboarding. Yeah. But even yes, maybe sorry. take things a step further and don't like pre-visualization in the 3D space, you know? Yeah. And, you know, like, again, which is why, like, I am really thinking of like short films over and over again because it's small scale and you are able to do like way more experiments at lower risk than if it were a big a larger film you know okay. and get to over the Janae, Janae, of I'm going to connect you I'm going to connect you off because my message before Oscar dropped off was you yeah. need to hurry up because it's almost midnight for Jimmy <laughs> <laughs> right. okay. okay yeah I feel but, okay, we'll take this off we'll continue we'll take this off we can have another yeah. like yeah. mini session um, yeah. But for everyone else, again, final point listening in that again, networking never stops by that. And you can see that these guys all at the top of their game and their individual games in their individual places in the world, still networking and still vibe and still get that enthusiasm bouncing off one another. So I hope everyone else felt that um, Oscar's internet and his Wi-Fi is failing him, which is why we have backups like me today. Um, so Aaron, Jimmy, Janae, Tim Tooney, thank you so much for a fantastic session. Um, we've been sh sharing the live online and we'll continue to do so so people can reach out to you. I've deliberately not asked you to put your LinkedIn in the chat because you will be inundated. Um, but uh, if you want to, you can. If you don't, don't feel the pressure. Um, there's plenty of places online for people to catch you. But it's been an honor having you here tonight. I'm really glad we stepped outside of our comfort zone a little bit um and worked with oscar and afrocomicade uh and brought you three together tonight uh thank you so much um i'm really glad that you could join us and thank you oscar as well this is in the recording so i better make sure i thank you too <laughs> thank you um so the three you guys can swim jimmy you can definitely go to bed now i'm just gonna say about yeah. our event next yeah week. i need to <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks boss all right thank you guys have a good one Right. Yes, thank you. Bye -bye. Well, it's nice to meet you, Jimmy. Thank you very much. Same here. Thank you. And so for everyone else, thank you for joining. Um, I hope you got a lot out of this evening. Uh, we're really thankful to Africa Comicade for um, being part of our event. Uh, last week, oh, sorry, last week. Last week was a really great event. Next week's going to be an even better one. Next week, we've got meet and greet with the Ghanaian uh, directors, mentors, and alumni of FI Ghana. Um, you're going to have Fifi and I, uh, which is unusual because we're never usually on that side of the camera, if you know what I mean. Um, we're usually hosting. Uh, and then we've got uh, one of our mentors, and the rest of us are grads. Um, and just a reminder that the applications for Fall 22 virtual cohort is this Sunday, the 21st of August. And when I say virtual, <clears throat> excuse me, it's 100% virtual. Not a single thing is done in person, which means it doesn't matter where in Ghana or the world you are, you can join our program. So go to fi.co slash Ghana um, for applications, for more information. And you can also reach out to us on our various uh, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook uh, profiles as well. Uh, that's all from us. Thank you to Africa Comicade. Um, I'm Simon. I'll stay online for a few moments um, once I've finished. If you've got any questions, um, just feel free to ask. But that ends the show. Thanks, everyone. Simon.